Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is James Harding. I'm the editor and uh, co-founder of Tortoise. And in many ways, this conversation we're going to have over the coming hour is why we set out to create a different kind of newsroom. The idea was, could you take some of the biggest issues of our times and bring in people with different views and voices to try and come to either a better understanding or more nuanced understanding of the issue, or to identify a way of telling the story, if you like a washing line that goes from one to another and along the way hangs all the issues for all to see. And I hope in the course of the next hour, as we talk about the assisted dying bill, as we ask the question whether the bill's safe, we'll hear from a host of people who will see this differently. And, you know, generally I come to these conversations and try to say, look, I haven't come with a fixed opinion. The, the truth is on the assisted dying bill, this is a story that in my journalistic career we've covered for a long time. When I was editing the Times, we moved from a sanctity of life to dignity of life position, so much closer to the position that uh, Baroness Meacher and Sarah Wooten have advocated. Um, but of course, I listened to and have since read the pages of Hansard um, from the second reading of the Bill in the Lords, and you can't help but be struck by the the, the genuine, firstly by the courtesy of the conversation in the Lords, but also by the real concern um, on all sides of this debate. And we'd like to get at some of that. So I suppose I wanted to start before I get to the group of people that we've brought together, just by saying, please start early in this conversation, message me, put your hands up. I'd like to bring you in. We've got some people who are really devoted to this issue and have thought deeply about this issue, but I suspect that everyone here is joining us this evening he has. And what I'd like to do is come away at the end of it, probably give like four or five minutes at the end, just to try and see where we take it from here. So please don't kind of be uh, coy, please don't wait till the end, kind of, if you even now have a point you want to make before we get started, put your digital hand up, message me in the chat, and we'll make sure that we bring you in right from the, right from the get go. Um, just to give you a sense of the kind of cast of characters, we used to have a theory about uh, thinkings that there should only be kind of one or two people because you'd only be able to hear them properly. In this case, there were just too many different perspectives we wanted to hear. Um, Sarah Wooten, who runs Dignity in Dying, and Sarah, I'm going to give a plug for your weekly email, because actually, if you want to follow this debate and understand some of the politics, um, uh, you should um, re read what Sarah writes. She's the chief executive of Dignity in Dying. Um, I was really struck by an extraordinary exchange in the House of Lords, and I'm going to ask the Bishop of Durham, Paul Butler, about it, um, about the way in which he responded to some of the comments from those people in favour of the bill, and I'm glad that um, uh, the Bishop of Durham, Paul Butler, is here. Um, uh, Trevor Moore, I think, is here too. I think uh, I'm excited, Trevor, because you challenge, uh, well, we'll hear from you how you challenge the thinking around this uh, this uh, this bill. I, I hope that Fiona um, Patton is here to give us a perspective from Australia. There's, there you are. Thank you, Fiona, waving away. We, we'd like to get beyond our own borders on this. And I'm really grateful to Zoe Marley Hyatt, because Zoe, I hope that you'll be able to tell us a little bit about this in a sense that links the personal to the to the policy uh, and in a different way Catherine Forrest um, a doctor who's a physician responsible for thinking about how this is actually done can tell us a bit about that so as you can see we're really trying to get all around the issue a big thank you uh, to my colleague uh, Nimo Omer who prepared the slide so that we've got some of the data and details and we're not coming at it completely uh, blind and likewise to Marks and Andrew who's really thought about trying to make sure we get the group of people right on this but why don't I start Sarah because Baroness Meacher whose bill this is in the Lords is the chair of Dignity and Dying in effect the wording of the bill has been you know crafted by Baroness Meacher I know with uh, Lord Faulkner and others and you do you want to just start by setting out exactly what the bill does ask for and what it doesn't ask for mm -hmm. um it's good to be here tonight um so um uh, Molly's bill which you're right is is very similar to Charlie Faulkner's bill um which came to before the Lords in 2014 
um, apart from one critical difference that um, there is an additional safeguard on Molly's bill of a high court judge, which makes it the safest assisted dying law in the world. So what the law would allow for is that a terminally ill adult who has six months to live, um, and that legislation is already written in to, to the UK through um, terminal illness benefits. So they would be dying, they would be mentally competent, they'd understand the implications of their actions, and they would have a choice of an assisted death in this country with the help of a physician. The safeguards, as well as the High Court judge, would be two doctors who've each independently come to the decision that, that this person is terminally ill, does fit those criteria. Um, so rather than someone having to go to Switzerland to have an assisted death, they'd be able to have the choice with a number of cooling off periods, a number of other safeguards. If there was any question of mental competence, then they would be assessed by a psychiatrist. So they would be able to have the choice of accelerating an unbearable death in this country. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, I said I'm going to start with make sure we hear from as many people as possible. Before I come to the Bishop of Durham, I'm going to see Zebedee Albee who's actually putting a point to you, Sarah. Actually, Zebedee, I don't know whether you want to put it yourself about safe, what constitutes safe. Where, where are you? Are you there? Yeah, hello. Hi, Hi there. there. Hi there. Yeah, I, I just didn't understand um, the uh, phrasing about um, whether or not the second reading in the House of Lords is safe. I just wondered whether it meant uh, safe to the people who die after it's passed. Um, is that is that is that what it's meant, or is there is there some sort of a possibility that um, you know that it's not going to pass, or is that is that what's meant? That's all. Well, if I can answer, I mean, what what I'm talking about is is how safe is assisted dying compared to the status quo, compared to the blanket ban on assisted dying at the moment, and the truth is that one Briton is going to Switzerland every week for an assisted death, that other people who are dying are taking their own life through suicide in this country. Some people are suffering, 17 people a day are suffering despite the very best palliative care. Doctors are afraid, they feel isolated, they feel they are abandoning their patients at the end of life. Uh, police and crime commissioners feel the law isn't working either. So what I'm saying is that the current law isn't safe and that assisted dying legislation would make people safer in this country. It is one of the, the important safeguards to have open and transparent scrutiny of what people are doing at the end of life. So, Sarah, I'm going to come back to you in a second, not least because I see that William Jeremy's raised this point about language and euthanasia, and I think Lord Winston did the same in the uh, House of Lords debate. But I'd love to come to Paul Butler, to the Bishop of Durham. Paul, if I might, before we actually get to what you think, there was a terrific exchange with you early on in which I think someone called Lord Vinson did the particularly bold thing in front of you, the Archbishop of Canterbury, of pointing out that uh, when Jesus was dying on the cross, a Roman uh, centurion stab, stabbed him and, and, and made the point that in effect, Jesus Christ's death was assisted. And then you made the point that that's not correct. So can we just, before we go any further, <laughs> let's get our New Testament straight. What actually happened on the cross? Uh, th th you're right. It, it was an interesting exchange. In fact, it, he he spoke uh, a while before me and was corrected by another member of the a lay member of the House of Lords before I got. But um, the, the text of, of John's Gospel is very clear that Jesus was already dead, mm -hmm. and that then a Roman pierced his side with a spear. So um, uh, Lord Vince was suggesting that um, uh, that the piercing with the spear had helped him die but that, that's that's not what the gospels record it was as simple as that James. <laughs> okay very good well you know i'm glad that we're doing fact checking at every level on this so I, i'm glad we got that established but, but paul can we, I, I tell you what i wanted to uh, why don't you just set out your position in response to what sarah said what baroness meacher and those who've argued in, on behalf of the bill have said um so uh th there's a, a, a Thank you, Sarah, for your for your introduction to it. Um, many of us remain deeply concerned that uh, whilst Sarah says it would be safe, that we don't think long, potentially it is safe for the most vulnerable. Um, there was a lot of discussion and debate about uh, people's autonomy um, uh, as if 
everybody is an entirely autonomous individual that is, who is not shaped and influenced by those around them. So there are, so there are questions about um, influence around them. There's questions about the doctor patient relationship um, as well. Uh, now, some of these uh, may well be answerable in debate. And if we get to have a committee stage of the, uh, the House of Lord, I probably ought to explain. Second reading of a private member's motion will be followed by a committee stage if the government give it time. Um, and even then, so the, the odds on this becoming law in the current session of Parliament are exceedingly low. I think we, we should be clear about that in terms of how the process, that's, that's not the rights or wrongs of it, that's just the legal processes. Um, so, but particular concerns around the most vulnerable, which was expressed by particularly from disability groups, this is not uh, a divide around particular groupings though, you know, there are, um, uh, Trevor's organization, I think it is, has has a clergy person on the on the board. Uh, former Archbishop of Canterbury argued in favor of the bill. Um, so uh, and there are those with disability who've argued in favor of the bill, though the majority seem to argue against. So uh, those are some of the issues uh, can, that we that lead us to I concern. Just, can I just ask you one thing, Paul, before we mm. before we go any further? There there is a there's an interesting thing that seems to have moved, and, and I'm going to come in a moment to Catherine Forrest and to Gail Addis, because one of the conversations in the Lords is about how much medical opinion has moved. But you couldn't help be struck by the fact that when Justin Welby stood up, the Archbishop of Canterbury, when you stood up, you weren't making a pure moral case. You weren't making a strict biblical sanctity of life case. You were making a, this bill is not safe. You know, the, the pressure that, you know, people who are terminally ill might come under from, you know, essentially unscrupulous family members or, you know, corrupt medical practitioners means that this is not a safe bill. Can I ask you, why is that your approach to the legislation? Are, are you saying that you don't any longer believe that sanctity of life is the critical issue here? Uh, no, absolutely, Jane. No, no, no. From a personal point of view, sanctity of life Think is it remains my ma my main personal objection, and and that of many. But however, um, I also am there as a parliamentarian that has to argue about the efficacy of the law that is in front of us, and so so I we come at it from from both uh, angles very strongly, and I'm quite happy to to debate the moral arguments. But that's but that there's a question when you're debating in the House of Lords. Uh, which bits seem to be the most sensible to, to debate, especially when you've only got two minutes. Yeah, by the way, one of the things that's absolutely fantastic about the debate, if everyone gets the chance, do go and read it online, is all of the interventions are incredibly short. So everyone really gets the point very fast. So, so that intrigued me in terms of the, the stance the Archbishop of Canterbury took and that you took. Actually, that's about the most effective argument within the House i.e. we're not going to hector people around the morality of sanctity of life, we're going to persuade them on the safety of the bill. And, and, and on the day, yes, that, that is some of, some of what, uh, how, we, how we go about it, absolutely. And um, all of us in the House operate to some extent on that, on that basis when you've got, a, when you've got a, a very short time limit. Well, um, I want to just bring in Brendan McCarthy, if I might, uh, Brendan, and Catherine, I'm going to come to you in a second, just because I just saw Brendan kind of weighing in on the kind of protecting the vulnerable is a moral stance. Uh, Brendan, do you want to just weigh in at this point? Yeah, just to affirm that there's it's a false dichotomy in one sense to suggest uh, sanctity of life is a moral argument, uh, but caring for vulnerable people isn't. Um, caring for vulnerable people isn't just a matter of pragmatism. Uh, and it's not just a matter, um, as far as the Church of England and the Lord's spiritual were concerned, of thinking, oh, well, this is the most effective bit uh, to make an argument uh, about. Uh, it's also because arguably it's the most important uh, bit of the debate to, to, to focus on. Uh, so protecting vulnerable people, and we accept that everybody in this debate is vulnerable, those who wish to die, those who may be placed under pressure to die, um, doctors, physicians, and so on. Uh, but th that is the core moral issue, uh, is the protection of the vulnerable. 
So I just want to say, you know, it, it's not morality as in the sanctity of life over against mere yeah. pragmatism. Uh, that is the central moral issue, in, in my opinion. James, Brent, James we should, be, we should, we should be, be, be clear. Brendan is, just so, so everyone on the call is aware, Brendan is the, is the, is the kind of key uh, ethical medical advisor to us in the House of Bishops on, on behalf of the Church of England. So, so forgive me. Okay, well, Brendan, th th a thank you. That's very much. Thanks, Paul. Uh, so, Brendan, then just can I just understand? So, what are you? Forgive me. You're saying that the ethical point is, or the moral point is, yes, there's a sanctity of life point, but the protection of the vulnerable from the exploitation of this bill is a moral point too. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I think there there are four major moral things being weighed up here. Uh, one is the the affirmation of life, which some might describe as the sanctity of life. Uh, the second one is caring for vulnerable people. Uh, the third one is how do we best build uh, a compassionate and cohesive society? Uh, and the fourth one is how do we best respect individuals? Uh, and the argument that we would present is those are the four major moral issues, uh, but they come in that order. They cascade, if you like, in, in, in that order. So if affirmation of life doesn't come first, uh, then, you know, our, our human rights law and our criminal code go out the window because so much of our law uh, is based on the affirmation of life. But then following that, um, the really pointy bit of that, as far as this discussion is concerned, uh, is focused on caring for vulnerable people. And one of the things, James, I'll say this as quickly as I can, uh, is that we have to accept we cannot meet the aspirations of everyone. We just can't do it. I, I appreciate that. But, but so we cannot make all vulnerable people uh, entirely safe. So it, it's down to how best do we, do we protect most vulnerable people? Uh, and, 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 and Brendan, forgive me, sorry to interrupt you. Of course. Uh, no I think problem. people understand the, the affirmation of life, the caring for the vulnerable. In fact, they'll, in the light of what Paul said, they'll understand the, the respect of individuals point in terms of autonomy in this process. The, 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 the cohesion of society point, can you just explain what you mean by that in relation to this bill? Well, I mean, it's, it's a, um, a bigger version of, you know, uh, no man is an island. Uh, the, the idea is uh, that if I, if I make a decision for myself, uh, it inevitably has repercussions for other people. Uh, and when it comes to Parliament over against uh, someone, you know, saying yes or no to uh, a survey uh, or a public opinion poll, when it comes to Parliament debating this, uh, the actions for individuals have got to be weighed for the actions uh, and, and the repercussions of those actions for absolutely everyone. Uh, so the, the, uh, our desire to build a cohesive and compassionate society uh, is one in which vulnerable people are cared for. Mm -hmm. uh, and th that's what I'm saying is we, we come to respecting individuals and we come to building uh, a cohesive and compassionate society through the lens or the focus of caring okay. for the vulnerable. Okay, Brendan, thank you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back to Sarah in a moment, who's who's responded in the chat in, in an interesting way, but Sarah, if, you, if I might, I'm gonna just do a few things first. I'd like to come to Catherine and to Gail, talk a little bit about the medical side. I really want to come to Trevor Moore because, you know, uh, my death, my decision ha has an argument with Sarah, on the other side of the ledger, if you like. Um, and also I see that Naomi Greenwood and Tom Schuler and Emma Jackson have made points. So I'm gonna to come to all of them just to say you're not being, you haven't been overlooked. Catherine, can, can I come with you to you first, if I might? Just, just, just can you tell me a little bit about what you do and how it works in the States? Thank you uh, very much for allowing me to participate. I am a family physician. I'm a faculty of uh, UC San Francisco and Stanford before that. I'm both a prescriber of, of uh, aid in dying and uh, have been a part of educating many physicians. As you know, uh, in California, our bill has been in place for five years, but Oregon has been placed for over a quarter century. So this intellectual conversation about what might be in vulnerable populations, there is zero data to support your fear. I feel that they are just fears. In fact, what we know is that the, these, these crucial conversations about how do we talk about end of life and what people want is to much more, m way better care at the end of life for everyone, including vulnerable populations. 
So I, I feel like the data just doesn't support uh, these, the fears and instead focuses on what do vulnerable populations need for themselves? And well, I'm, if I'm you want to support vulnerable yeah, populations, that leads us a different place. What I wanted to say here was that I, I have um, a, a couple of things. One is, um, and, and it's going to make me, it, it's going to, it's difficult to have this conversation because I've also very recently, my, my own husband died, he's an aide in dying uh, this last summer. And when you're talking about um, the slippery, the concept of a slippery slope and are there enough safeguards, what we know, um, those of us both medical community and I practice in the safety net, what we call it in, in the US, the safety net, taking care of poor people, um, is that the biggest problem is not, um, is access to care, but that we're not seeing people that are not getting the care resorting to aid and dying that's just not happening globally so it's what we're seeing instead is that the barriers what you call safeguards we have been make what we put into place what what you're looking for legislation right now to put into place for safety um to be thoughtful and and deliberative in is this the right thing for this person among various options you, you can also go too far so people are suffering People are suffering and you want to be in that balance of making sure that options that, that do suffering the most vulnerable, every one of us is going to die. Do we want to make sure that what's right for them and that, that very vulnerable population is nothing like with a suffering human being to say, no, you can't, we're not going to do the thing that will help you. Literally, they're dying. Catherine, Catherine. Catherine. Sorry, I just want to. Sorry, forgive me for interrupting you. I tell you what I would love to know if you would just t tell us is, it, what's happening in your experience? I.e., when a patient is coming to you, when a person is coming to you to ask for aid in dying, wh what's the process and what do you personally do? Um, it is we're required, to, and as we should, we are required to talk about all the options. So it opens this very. Um, rich conversation about dying and the process of dying and what, what does someone want? How do they want to live the life that they have left in the time that they have? And do they want to be transferred? What is palliative care, which is um, neither life extending or life decreasing? Do they want to be at home in hospice care? Uh, do they want not be in hospice care and have extension through treatments? A very rich conversation or for some do they want aid in dying mm -hmm. we see in almost because it's legal now almost uh, those are curious they want to know about it a relief that they that there is an right. option if they have suffering to their what's suffering to them it's mm -hmm. not an external judgment of me saying how could you live this very much like childbirth so if somebody comes into the hospital and you say you're suffering you're not suffering enough mm -hmm. you don't get an epidural you're not suffering enough this, this is, you know, it's not, we're not going to go down that pathway. There's no external judgment to what suffering is. They get they to decide happen. what they're. Catherine, forgive me. I'm sorry for interrupting. I just want to make sure I bring in Gail Addis, who was just saying that as a, as a doctor, she had a, a similar view to yours, Catherine. Gail, what was the point you were making? Well, I, I just backing up what Catherine said, I mean, 250 million people live under a form of legislation like this already in the world. Um, the majority now of doctors in the UK support it and certainly a large number of uh, the public, about 90% of the public. Um, we know that one a week's going over to Switzerland. It's, it gives people an option. I think a lot of people who might sign up for it don't take up the option but it's a great comfort to people uh, uh, right. um, to know that they have that option if things come to e extremes, particularly in the last few months of life. And Gail, and I think that's you, humane. Um, yeah. Can you can you explain to us why? Uh, you know, I think you know, I think when when Baroness Meacher stood up and was talking about, you know, essentially reform to a bill that that was passed in 1961, the suicide legislation. We understand that things have moved since then. What's really surprising is how fast it feels as though opinion in the medical community has moved since 
the last time the Lords brought this, since mm -hmm. you know Joel Joffe brought the, the these issues to the House, what what's going on? Why do you think medical opinion has moved so fast? Or, and and do you really sort of trust the statistics and the numbers? Um, I, as far as I know, the statistics are accurate. I know that from the BMJ f fairly recently. Um, that's how, how I know that. I think it's interesting that the medical um, <laughs> the medical opinion has actually followed public opinion. And, and I think that's different. What what has changed? Um, it's difficult to say. I think I, I was a GP. I also did some uh, work in palliative care in a hospice. But mainly my uh, experience was in general practice. When people said to me, you wouldn't let this happen to a dog, I, I'd almost every time. <laughs> yeah, no, I saw I saw in front of Camilla Cavendish, my old colleague, stood up in the House of Lords and said, you know, how can we explain the fact that, you know, we are can be we, we treat our pets differently to humans? Um, Gail, thank you. I, I, I want to just sorry, before I come to Fiona Patton, because I would love to hear the Australian example. Can I can I uh, bring in Zoe Marley Hyatt? Because on the one, you know, Catherine just talked about her personal experience. And I don't know whether Zoe, you can tell us a little bit about yours. Yeah, um, five months ago, my husband um, came through a terminal illness and uh, ended his life. Prior to that, my mother also had terminal cancer and she also ended her life. They both desperately needed to be able to communicate what they needed to the healthcare providers. And um, on both occasions, the, their their questions and their desires to talk about their death was closed down and what was resonating really interestingly with me was with Dr Forrest as she was saying about a rich conversation around death we are all going to die and when you're presented with a terminal illness and you know that this is something that's going to happen you you know and you want to try and plan it and you want to try and do it well you know at the end of this journey you were going to die and you want that to be a good death mm. and and it's it's so important that we're able to sort of talk to our healthcare providers and be able to feel confident that they're going to not close us down really understand i mean we you know we were often together when we were talking to them and they often would sort of say, oh, don't worry, we've got anticipatory drugs we'll put in the house for you. And, and, you know, this is going to be okay. And there was a lot of reassurances, but they did close us down when we wanted to ask about, you know, how you know, maybe within the framework of, of the law, we, we desperately wanted to know that if it got too difficult, could, what would happen? What would happen if it got just too difficult? And, and in I'm both occasions it did. And so, and so uh, sorry, so we, we don't know each other. So some of these questions are quite personal, but w one of them is to say, I think one of the arguments of those people who are worried about the safety of the bill is that in the way in which you're caring about your, you know, family, there are those people who are not really caring about the family. They're looking to themselves and they can exploit this legislation, essentially mm -hmm. sort of to push people towards the exit. Um, how much How much do you worry about that, that in effect the kind of, if you like the sort of goodness and care and compassion that you're exhibiting gets you know exploited and abused at, at the moment um i don't think people are safe i think it's very easy uh, to to i know that my mother would have really really been so happy to have two independent doctors discuss her end of life with her she would have felt incredibly confident knowing that a high court judge was presiding over this whole process. At the moment, what, what is happening is things are going on behind closed doors. The vulnerable are not being identified. So at the moment, actually, we have a very unsafe situation, a dangerous situation. The first time my mother tried to escape her illness, and that's how she saw it, she was, um, she got it wrong and she became conscious again after the attempt. She was so ill. She had been really made herself very, very ill. And she was so without hope. Mm -hmm. The journey that she had gone through thinking that she could end her life if it got too difficult, that, that, that hope was taken from her at that point. It's, I think at the moment things are very vulnerable and very dangerous. And yeah. I, I, I've seen it personally. 
and I would like to think that we could do better for our dying. And yes, they are the most vulnerable people in society and they have no rights at the moment. And Zoe, That's sorry, that. when you said that your mother took your own, her own life, how did she then do that? Well, she attempted, she attempted to do it the first time was she wanted to, she was very frightened that because there was a 14 year prison sentence attached to it as being assisted or, or supported to, she was very frightened about my involvement or any of her family's involvement. So she went into the garden. The first time she tried to do that with a lot of sleeping tablets and with alcohol. And, you know, it was an enormous amount she took, but it failed. And that process was really dreadful because I had wanted to bring her inside. And we had a situation where the NHS doctor that was pre that ended up coming wanted to take her to hospital she didn't want to go to hospital we ended up with the police in the house it was a absolute terrible scenario you know they didn't know what to do she laid on the floor in the garden until three o'clock in the morning um, because the police didn't know whether to take her to hospital I was her lasting power of attorney which was my position and I knew that she didn't want to go to hospital so there was a big sort of circus that went around which was relating to how ineffective the law is at the moment um, and this, then a month then transpired because she wasn't successful on that occasion. And she then attempted again to, to uh, I don't like to use the word commit suicide. It's, it, she wanted to assist herself to die. Already the processes of dying were taking place. Mm -hmm. And so she, she took an overdose uh, uh, again and was successful this time. Zoe, thank you. Thank you for expla explaining it. I, I really do appreciate it. I, I want to just pick up on a point that Catherine made around kind of the conversation around this and then how many people act on it and how many um, don't, because Fiona Patton is here. And Fiona, you you made a point in the chat and you, you know, you've got the experience in Australia. Can you, can you just tell us a little bit about the Australian bill by comparison with the Meacher bill? and what the experiences of a legislation once it's enacted. Thank you, James, and thanks. thank you for the invitation today. Um, the legislation is quite similar from my understanding. I, have, I must say I haven't looked at the full details of, of the, the Baroness Meacher's piece, but I'm, it's, we're, we're seeing a commonality in legislation, whether it's Oregon, California, or the various states in Australia that have um, legalised voluntary assisted dying. We, we have, um, yeah, so I think they're very similar. What we found in, Aust in my state of Victoria, which has about 6 million people, is that in the two and a half years that we, we've had the legislation, we, I think I, I put the numbers in the chat, but um, about a third of the people who were assessed for assisted dying uh, actually used the medication. Uh, but what we've, the conversations, I think Dr. Catherine, Dr. Catherine Forrest really raised that, the conversations around a good death, the conversations around end of life, that is what doctors are reporting has improved. Uh, the ability for people to talk about choices, to talk about um, their end of life much more readily. And it, during the debate that we had in 2017 here, and I was fortunate to be on the parliamentary committee that did the inquiry into uh, voluntary assisted dying, the coroner was probably the most compelling because the coroner spoke about the number of people who had killed themselves because of, with terminal illnesses. And it was quite an extraordinary number. And I, I, I may have this wrong, but I think it was about 80% of people over 80 who had um, killed themselves, uh, had terminal illnesses and had done it to, to end pain and suffering. So we, we see the legislation has actually probably um, put in more checks and balances and just going to the point of families exploiting the reports that we're having from doctors is that the far from um, families trying to encourage people to go down a voluntary assisted dying path, it's actually trying to stop them. Mm -hmm. And we've seen doctors are saying that they have numerous times when they're having where parents or families have come in to try and prevent their their loved one from going through the getting the prescription and going through the approval process and fiona one, one of the one of the things that i think you hear here around the the move to the 
Meacher bill is the ACS at the moment, if you look in Oregon, if you look in California, if you look in Australia, the numbers are very, very low. So we're in danger of worrying much too much about something that actually then touches very few people. Have you seen over the last few years, though, a kind of hockey stick? Is this normalizing and that the numbers are increasing significantly? Uh, not, not at all. Not, not at all. Um, it's the numbers have been the same, and I and I think it's um, uh, you know, and re, I mean, Oregon has had these le this legislation for twenty five years, and when we l reflect on the on the numbers in Oregon, Aus Australia's numbers or Victoria, which has had assisted dying in Australia for the longest, are quite similar. You know, it's a it's a very small number of people. So in two and a half years, three hundred people out of a population of six million um, have yeah. used voluntary assisted dying. Fiona, thank you. I, I want to bring, if I might, Trevor Moore, just because, Trevor, I know that we're sort of tiptoeing around these issues, if you like, as defined between the Bishop of Durham and, and uh, uh, Dignity and Dying and Sarah Woodman, Arsmicha. I know that, you know, my death, my decision, there's an argument that, that actually this legislation is, is insufficient for different reasons. Yes, uh, thanks very much for inviting me along this evening. I would like to start by saying that um, My Death, My Decision is united with dignity in dying in seeking an assisted dying law. It's just that the uh, what form it might take, uh, we differ because we look to what we call the Canada model, which would uh, allow people to have an assisted death if they are terminally ill uh, without any um, restriction on the time limit for that. And also if they are what we call incurably suffering, because there are people who aren't actually terminally ill, but by any stretch um, are incurably suffering. And we know from the opinion polls that uh, the public, as, you, as your stats showed at the beginning, the, the public is substantially in favor of an assisted dying law, and actually well over a majority um, is in favor of a law of the scope that we describe. And that's why we hope that in the debate in parliament, we get the opportunity to hear the evidence, because if I could just pick up on one issue that Paul raised about the vulnerable, um, this is always raised, but actually when you try to find evidence in those jurisdictions that already have an assisted dying law, um, it just isn't there. And I would say that the people that Zoe was describing um, are very vulnerable. They're the, they're the people who want an assisted death in this country, but are forced to go to Switzerland. Um, and uh, our, our former patron, Dawn Boyce Cooper, who had an assisted death in Switzerland on the 26th of October, had to keep everything secret because she didn't want people to know who might try to stop her. Um, and uh, that makes it even worse, because if you think about it, the well, one thing you would like to be able to do is to talk to uh, those close to you uh, about what, what your plans are, but you can't because there are potential legal consequences that uh, are a minefield under our current system. So for anyone to say that our current law works, just uh, that's not right. And, and, and but just to be clear, Trevor, the, the in the same way in which, if you like, the Bishop of Durham, the Archbishop of Canterbury are kind of making an argument about the safety of the bill or, or the unsafeness in their view of the bill. In your case, if you were to try and make publicly the argument that you're making, which goes further than Sarah Woodman's going, don't you think that you risk actually losing the argument and losing the politics of this because people begin to worry, well, what is a terminal illness? What is significant suffering? What are the implications for people with disability? And before you know it, your position become, become seen as kind of ushering, easing people towards death in a way that is much, much harder to manage and becomes dangerous. Well, all, all, all one can do is point you to places where they, they have a law um, to that extent. And, and what, what I would say is that our parliament is obviously capable of, and our decision makers are capable of concluding on legislation which they feel is right for this country. And we shouldn't get too um, bound by what we think uh, uh, other countries do because we're well known for, for being innovative and finding solutions. Um, but the idea that the system in Canada, for example, is dangerous, uh, I think they'd be appalled to hear that adjective uh, ascribed to them. And, and they, 
the scope of their law is very similar to what uh, we campaign for at the moment. Right, well, I'm, I'm going to bring in because there are a few different there are a few different voices I'd like to hear, to hear from. I see my colleagues Basha Cummings and Giles Patel have made a point, so I'm going to come to Basha and Giles. I mentioned Naomi Greenwood. I see Naomi there. Naomi, what was the point you were going to make? Oh, hello there. I can see you. I think you just have to. There you are. You're unmuted now. You should be unmuted. Are you unmuted? No. Oh, would, can you? Oh, sorry, Naomi. But oh, 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 can you unmute yourself? Okay. There you Can go. You yeah, got you, got you loud and clear. Okay. Um, I was concerned about the High Court judge, not because I don't approve. Of course I do. I think we have to have someone very high up for that. Given the backlog in the courts today with the most serious crimes already, I would feel that they would have to put in place a special department, um, maybe with trained judges, not necessarily High Court judges because otherwise people can wait two years for their case to be heard, it'll become irrelevant. So, Naomi, thank you very much. I saw, by the way, Fiona Patton nodding as you were saying that. Sarah, do you want to just come back on, uh, on that? Because also in the Lords, funnily enough, although you put the High Court judge um, element into the legislation, some people were uncomfortable about that because in effect it asked a judge to play God. Mm. So we're, we're talking to the, um, the family court judges at the moment, actually, about what the process might be. I, I think it's important for people to realise that, that judges can act incredibly quickly when they need to in these family cases. You know, within hours, they can constitute courts or they could go into someone's front room and they can, they can look at the safeguards around something. While I've got the floor, James, can I just come back to the point that I made earlier, going right back to the beginning around... Um, what the bishop said about whether this is going to become law or not. I want to point out that um, opponents have, have tabled getting on for 200 amendments already just before Molly's bill gets to committee stage. But those amendments in themselves, they, they, they demonstrate that, that opponents have an in principle objection to this law. They're, they're not ones that actually better protect patients. They're putting assisted dying out of reach. So, um, one, one amendment tries to, um, to change assisted dying to assisted suicide throughout. Another one changes the uh, mention of life-ending medication to lethal drugs. Um, somebody else has, has asked that a dying person self-certify that they understand the finality of death. Um, somebody else... You, 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 think that, you think these are just all different attempts to throw kind of sand in the cogs of this process? So we, we know that, that um, Charlie Faulkner's bill was talked out. If it's, not given, if it's not given government time, then there won't be enough time for this debate to be had. The bishop was absolutely right about that. But the point is that there is, is government time given to Scottish private members' bills. And there is a private member's bill under consultation there at the moment. The, the point is that it's not good enough to say that this isn't going to happen. It is going to happen. The country is supportive of this. It unites people. It unites all demographics. You know, red wall, blue wall, whatever demographic you look at, people want the choice at the end of life. It better protects people. So I don't think it's good enough to say it's not going to happen. I think that we really need to listen to the current, to what's going on at the end of life and how people aren't protected and are exposed by this cruel law. Can I, can I ask, um, I'm going to come to, uh, uh, well, let me actually come on. I just want to hear from uh, Basha Cummings. Basha, because you're making points, I think, similar to Naomi's about whether or not we can actually do what the legislation would be asking us to do. Yeah, I, I guess my point was that we're talking about, I was so struck by what um, Catherine said about the rich conversations, the idea that, you know, when you reach such a difficult moment in the life of a loved one, you want to feel like you have a healthcare system that is able to support you at that moment. And that means doctors who have the time and the capacity, that means nurses who aren't, you know, doing 10 other things and desperately understaffed it means investment I think to be able to deliver deaths that that meet our expectations our ethical expectations and our moral expectations and and I wonder whether we're whether we are culturally and sort of spiritually there as a population but perhaps not practically there um, and I wonder what what it would require for us to be practically there and what and just out 
and what do you really mean by that? Are you basically like, I see where we're going, but I'm not ready yet? No, I'm ready. I mean, I, I think anyone who's watched a loved one die in a protracted and painful way is probably ready because when I saw somebody close to me die in a, in a desperately painful way, I thought that I just wouldn't treat an animal in the way that, that I, we, were, we were extending this person's life for no other reason than for a sort of a abstract devotion to the idea that if, if they weren't in so much pain, they would simply want to be alive. And I, I thought it was an, a, an absurdity. Um, I think it's, a, it's, it's that there is a practical consideration, which is the way in which they died in the ward where they died felt totally inappropriate. And if we had better investment and, a, and hospitals or there were specific places set up in which you could sort of shepherd people out of their life in an ethical way, that feels like where we would go next once we sort of make this leap legally. Uh, and I suppose that's what I'm asking. Can I just can I can I come back to the couple of things I want to just come back to? One is just the reality in the chat between, if you like, the the kind of to and fro between Brendan and Sarah on the data, because it's quite you're, you're getting two very different impressions. Not least because, as often the case with data, you can kind of choose your friends. It, is there? I said at the beginning, actually, if you go back and you look at the nature of the debate in the House of Lords, it's extremely respectful and courteous. In public debates, in political debates, things are not always that nice. Is there a place where, Brendan and Sarah, you feel as though actually you do come together and the, and the data itself is agreed? Or, or is the data so far contested? Brendan? Yeah, I, I put those bits in, in, in the chat. Um... Just because I, I think the, the the data was used maybe in conversation a little bit loosely, the impression was given the majority of doctors in in the UK, um, whereas in fact are are in favour of a change in the law, whereas the votes for the RCP was thirty one point six percent, for the BMA it was forty percent, which is why both of those organisations moved to neutrality. Uh, so I think uh, we have to be you know car careful in how we present the the data. Um, I, like like you, James, I, I really appreciated the tone of the House of Lords debate, mm, which yeah. I thought was, was excellent, and, and there wasn't really much point scoring. Um, and you know, I, I would love to have uh, a proper, lengthy discussion in public with Sarah and, and, and others who are in favour of the change in the law, uh, where we're not having simply to make um, hit and run points, because yeah. uh, I think this entire debate for years and you know I've been involved in advising the Church of England for 13 years in this debate uh, and too much of it has been marred by hit and run points uh, and I could make lots of hit and run points uh, I'm sure well, well, I don't want to <laughs> <laughs> thank you Listen, I, I do know a, do a doctor I want to come to one Michael Harding otherwise known as dad um do you want to <laughs> we, I just want to I'm interested uh, the reason I want to uh, ask you what you think of this is there's been a really interesting point, partly because you mentioned me saying, actually, this is one of the few, I think it's the first thinking you've ever said that you'd actually like to weigh in. But there's a really interesting point that, in the, that Bob Rice has made about the death of King George V, which is about the way in which his physicians actually um, uh, treated him in the, in the final days of his life. And I suppose that almost everyone here this evening knows that there are often cases where doctors help alleviate suffering towards the end of someone's life. And in fact, it might even be the case that in alleviating that suffering, they accelerate the, the, the point of death. And I just wondered what you think of the argument that says, actually, this has long been left to doctors and maybe doctors rather than judges should deal with this. Um, thank you very much for allowing me to speak. And I have to declare an interest, not only as a doctor, but also as a father. And we've had many discussions and I have, you know, I've really been committed to this change. Um, I think it is, I think, for everybody to recognise, and they all do, that this is the greatest privilege in part of our lives to attend death. And I'm not talking only about doctors, I'm also talking about anybody who is involved in the death of their loved one or their parishioner or whatever else. Um, when you talk about um, whose responsibility is it, it is the individual's responsibility to decide their mode of death. 
And this is what it is to choose whether in fact to hasten their death and to allow that suffering to be relieved, whether it be a long-term suffering or a short-term suffering. This bill is trying to make it simple in terms of um, covering all the issues about coercion, about pressure, and I think it does it as well as can be. I think when you come to the question about the judges, um, when in fact Joffe came, there was no question about a judge being involved. But when in fact the Faulkner bill came about, it was quite interesting when I can't remember exactly who suggested that a high court judge should be involved. I think Sarah's point about availability of high court judge and that their ability to measure the situation is indeed well taken, but I am not in I just think that this is yet another hurdle, which I think really needs to be reconsidered at some later stage. That's my view about the, the, the law coming into it. Mm -hmm. um, this is a, a situation that, uh, that really can be dealt with with common sense and allowing people to shorten their lives is something that we really should allow to happen. Uh, and I think that's the point I, I really wanted to make. And also one more thing, it is a privilege to attend a family and a, 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 a soon, to, soon to die individual. Um, and to achieve that, to relieve suffering is one of the most important mm -hmm. um, duties of a doctor. Mm -hmm. Uh, that, thank you. C can I, bef before we end, I wanted to go back, if I might, just to Paul Butler and Sarah Wooten. I know there are lots of other people who've got things to say, but I, if I might, I'm just going to, if you like, sort of put the counter argument to each of you. Paul, can I st start with you? And, the, and, and I suppose, sort of being sort of direct about it, do you worry that the church gets itself on the wrong end of this issue? in the way in which it has on other issues about love, in that in its, in its devotion to an idea of the sanctity of life, it constructs arguments or it, it, it propels the arguments around the safety of this bill. But in the end, it's on the wrong side of many, many people who in different ways are saying, at the very end of a life that cannot be saved, let's try and make sure out of love, we give someone a good death. And the church is seen to be an obstacle to that. Uh, that's, that's, that's a reasonable question, James. I, I, a, the church has never uh, been there to um, always be on the side of those who are going to agree with it. So, that, so you know, we're, we, we will often be out of step on all sorts of things. I've, apparently, according to the Telegraph, I'm completely out of step on refugees and asylum seekers today, for example. Um, so. Uh, so that's slightly. We, we can all, I couldn't, we can all agree <laughs> disagree with the Telegraph. But I think we have a quick and easy unanimity there. Um, I, 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 I want to slightly. I, I think one of the things that's, that this has opens up, and I, I did put this in the chat. I think as a society, we are not good about talking about death mm -hmm. and dying, and I think we as the church. Uh, ought to be helping us have better conversations about death and dying as a whole. Um, Catherine made a very uh, has made an observation in the in the chat. The way that medical care and science has moved on means that people are surviving in all kinds of ways, which uh, mean that the the lines are getting finer and finer. And uh, then you know, it's it's fine talking about the George V thing. The the world of medicine is so different, actually, from in George George V's time, that I that I think there is an argument that we are we are keeping people alive far too long and unhelpfully. We're not allowing people to die well in the sense of letting go. Um, so, I, so, so there is some ground there in the middle where I think actually we should be having a bigger, wider debate. And that's why I'm, I'm, I think I'm with Trevor Moore, that actually some kind of proper public inquiry that looks at the, bet, the best ways of handling death and dying in our society might be a very helpful thing to do. And, and Paul, thank you. And I'm, I'm conscious of running out of time. Because Sarah, I want to put something to you in 
sort of by return of post and the way in which I put that point about the institution of the church to Paul one of the things that I worry about and wonder about in the process that Baroness Meacher that you are pursuing is to try and push this legislation through the House of Lords and the, the reason that makes me uncomfortable is a lot of the time I spend saying oh my goodness I can't believe they put Peter Crudders in the House of Lords you know some political donor or I, you know, I can't quite make sense of having the largest, you know, second chamber in the world after, you know, the Chinese National People's Congress. It doesn't feel as though trying to make a change of this scale by using the House of Lords as the entry point feels like an expression of public opinion and public consultation. There are many people who will see that as quite an elitist way to change fundamental behaviours and cultural norms in a country. And, and I wonder why there is not and whether there should be a much bigger process, public consultation process, political process that really engages the, the parties rather than taking this, this route through the Lords. Well, I mean, that, that's the way our laws are created, isn't it? I mean, we're a democracy and Parliament has to make the law. So we have been to the courts and taken several cases there, but ultimately the courts have said that it is for Parliament to decide, and, and both Parliaments, Holyrood and Westminster, because this is devolved to Scotland. I think as well, I draw comparators with historical law change, like abortion, uh, like equal marriage. There are huge similarities with those, and, and those laws were changed in Parliament. Um, and I think we will manage to change that. So I think that people will look back and say, you know, how barbaric the status quo was. Um, and I think that you know, in terms of an inquiry, you know, so many people need this law now. So, you know, once somebody, somebody's going to Switzerland every week, why are we outsourcing good deaths to Switzerland? We, we need law change now. We don't need more inquiries we we need a law so if we if we could if we could have government time from the prime minister then we would get it through parliament um, we intend to get it through holyrood so, so but sarah thank you first i want to just say thank you very much everyone for coming and i appreciate there are lots of people we didn't hear nearly enough from um i sort of wish we were doing this in person i suspect we'd sit around in the newsroom for two or three hours talking and arguing and thinking um a, a, a couple of things just from us really practically one is i do think there's a really interesting job to be done to try and um and i'm looking at my colleague charles patel here to try and actually look at this through the numbers to try and do that job you know that kind of understands what brendan's saying what sarah's saying and 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 deal with it in terms of the data because i thought the point that fiona Patton made about the number of suicides of elderly people who were suffering was a really interesting one and i just don't have that data for example in the uk i did think that also trying to understand the implications that basha mentioned and sarah then touched on about you know actually the the practice in the high court and i think naomi greenwood made the same point which is you know who's actually doing that how that works is something that we could also uh take a look at um as i said i came into this um with a with a point of view i am really interested more and more interested by the point of view that's on the opposite opposite side of it so i'm really appreciative of being able to understand kind of what those four points are that come from the church and some of those concerns i also feel as though on the other side of the argument on kevin uh uh, Trevor Moore's side of the argument, I really want to understand better what the risks are if this is extended beyond the Meacher bill. So I think all of those things are really interesting. I, I'd raise two really obvious points at the end. One is that I was told that the most interesting thing that you can do in journalism, I'm going to show you a little drawing I made earlier, is that this is what happens when public opinion sits within the law. And this is when journalism gets interesting, when public opinion shifts outside the box of the law. And what happens there is either the public opinion moves back or the law shifts. And I think training, trying to work out how that happens is really interesting. And for us to do that, it feels to me as though we need to move our attention from the House of Lords to the House of Commons and try to track more closely what's happening in the politics there. The last meaningful conversation I had on this in any way was with a man called Howard Dean, who was a doctor running for the Democratic uh, uh, nomination of the US presidency in 2004. We were both taking a very, very early flight 
flight from Chicago O'Hare, which was the reason I think he was kind of willing to talk about anything. And I said, what's the most difficult thing to talk about in American politics? And he said, the culture of death. And I'm not sure that whatever it is, uh, 17 years later, much has changed. And if there's anything that we have managed to agree on is that we need to do more to talk about that better. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Thank you to the Bishop of Durham. Thank you to Sarah Wooten. Thank you to Zoe uh, Marley, to Catherine Forrest, to Fiona Patton, God knows what time it is uh, there, to Trevor Moore too, but most importantly to all of you for joining and weighing in on this conversation. It really has been interesting. And I hope we don't leave it there. We've got more to learn. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you.